Hi, I'm Nan Hayworth, and I am a board certified ophthalmologist, former member of Congress for the 19th District of New York, and privileged to be a member of the board of the Independent Women's Forum. Uh, and I am extremely privileged to host this episode of She Thinks with Dr. Stanley Goldfarb, who is a board certified kidney specialist, former professor and associate dean for curriculum at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And now as of uh, April, I believe it is of 2022, uh, the founder of Do No Harm, uh, which is an organization uh, that is uh, designed to return uh, rigor to medical curricula and physician training and rescue it uh, from the clutches of uh, woke uh, depredations. And I'm going to ask Dr. Goldfarb in just a second to uh, uh, expound on that for all of our listeners. So Dr. Goldfarb, um, I also send best wishes for my husband who served with you on an Aetna advisory committee a number of years ago. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> was, was very glad that I was going to be speaking with you. So welcome, uh, Dr. Goldfarb. Uh, tell us, I, I am a member and supporter of Do No Harm, but if you would, if you can explain to our, our listeners uh, exactly what Do No Harm is, what inspired you to found it, and what your aims are. Sure, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be with you and to be with independent women who are, uh, I think, the only kind of women there should be. So <laughs> that's great. Um, so uh, maybe I should start a little bit with the with how I got here, and then it'll I think it'll make sense with what we're doing. So this all started back in actually about 2017 when I was sort of finishing up my career at Penn. I'd been there for almost 50 years or so at that point. And uh, I was, as you said, the associate dean for curriculum and managing all the medical students teaching act, uh, learning activities and guiding the faculty and all that and the way they were presenting the information. And uh, a woman who was our uh, my boss, um, and I've had many women bosses who I've thought have been fantastic, and uh, she um, she was kind of pushed out because she had been in that position for a long time, even though she was incredibly successful. Another woman was hired. She came in from, the, she had been at the University of Connecticut to run the educational program at Penn. And she brought with her a worldview that I was really quite unfamiliar with, which was that um, medicine should have a much greater social dimension to it and should be much more involved in issues like um, climate change and, um, you know, food uh, security in the community and housing, things that I, I thought were sort of weird, actually, because we didn't know anything about those issues and uh, had no expertise in teaching about them. But anyway, uh, she pushed that. When I kind of pushed back, she told me one day, uh, science, there's too much science in our curriculum anyhow. Uh, and at that point, I was kind of moved out of my position because I clearly was someone who didn't agree with her. Now, as in that final year that I, I served under her, it became clear to me that this was going on around the nation. This was not unique to Penn, but this was this was an act, uh, kind of a, a, a force that was being inserted into medical education that was going to make it look more like social work school, and it was like a hard science learning how to care for sick people. And I thought this was very peculiar. Um, and ultimately, uh, one day I read in the Wall Street Journal that um, 42 medical schools had courses in climate change, you know, I had pushed back against a faculty member that wanted to do that at Penn. And I, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal. He wrote back saying he didn't even know about that article, but he said, why don't you write an op-ed? So I wrote an op-ed in 2019. It was titled, uh, Take Two Aspirins and Call Me By My Pronouns by the Wall Street Journal. And this led to an explosion in something called Med Twitter, uh, where people <laughs> denounced me I'm familiar uh, with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Petitions were signed that I should be uh, thrown out of pen. And and mind you, the only thing I was advocating at that point was that we were teaching too much about social issues in the curriculum, yes. that we needed to return to hard science. And, and the reason I thought it was a problem was because there's only so many hours in the day. And if you spend more and more time on these topics, then you have less time to learn about urology, for example. Right. We didn't even have a course in urology per se. We, there wasn't enough time in the curriculum. Students right. get taken as an elective, and yet we had required teaching about some of these social issues. So 
at that point, uh, you know, that I became a pariah at that point. People that I had worked with for years refused to look at me in the hall. Uh, fortunately, I was kind of at the end of my time because I didn't have to put up with this much. And I, I went on sabbatical. And on that sabbatical, I wrote a book. The book has come out. The book had the same title. The publisher kind of liked the title, even though I thought it was. It's a great of, book. <laughs> well, thank you. I, 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 never I liked it. it. Oh, that's great. I never yeah. liked the title because I thought it was. Yeah, I really wasn't concerned much with gender issues, although now we are a bit more, as I'll discuss. Yes. But, um, yes. but um, so I wrote the book, and then it was quite clear, were well, we going to do anything about these issues? And that's where we come to the present and do no harm. And through some um, serendipity, I was able to work with uh, individuals that had great experience in some of these um, advocacy activities and how to really start to make change, particularly in the realm of, of K through 12 education, where they had been fairly successful. And we started Do No Harm. And fortunately, we, we've been, you know, well resourced. So we've had lots of um, opportunity to both um, have our ideas published in, in, the, in the lay media and also I've had the opportunity to push in certain ways uh, about uh, trying to change some of these issues. So to, to tell the, your audience exactly what we're, what we're for, we're for the elimination of all discrimination in healthcare. And I was just actually before our podcast, listening to the arguments in front of the Supreme Court about the Harvard and UNC case and whether there ought to be affirmative action in, um, in, in, uh, uh, admission to Harvard or University of North Carolina. And, you know, the same arguments really pertain to medical school, but medical school, it's a little bit different because now it's not just our job is to train people that are going to be ready to go out and to work in the business world or whatever world. We're training people that are going to have people's lives in their hands. And I think it's incumbent upon us when we think about these issues of what opportunities do we want to have for students as to what the students are going to do with those opportunities? And in this case, I, I've always thought about medical education as there was the school, there was the student, and there was a third person in the room, and that was the patient. And whatever we did, we had to worry about what was the best thing for the patient, not just what was the best thing for the student. I, I care about the students, but their welfare is not number one. Number one is the patient's welfare. And yes. Some of the, these, in, these uh, discriminatory activities that are going on in medicine are what we're fighting against. So, so do no harm. The first thing we did after we launched um, was we sued the federal government because we see that the legal system is, is a potential uh, part of the toolbox that we need in order to make changes and to push back against these in, this, it's really critical race thing, theory being introduced into medical education Absolutely. and medical care. Absolutely. You know, that whites are oppressing blacks and that's the reason that there are disparities. We agree right. there are disparities in health outcomes. We just don't believe that they're a function of the way blacks are treated once they enter the healthcare system. The problem right. is access, not how they're treated once they're in a healthcare system. And to decide that you're going to focus on how they're treated in the healthcare system, you're going to waste a lot of time and effort. So the first thing we did was we sued and stop me whenever, you know, I'm going. <laughs> now, on this is fascinating. I, I've got, I've got, of course, all these thoughts are tumbling through my head because I uh, find your arguments compelling and your courage uh, incredible. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about those in just a moment, but please do tell us about your lawsuit and where it stands right now. Well, actually, we have three lawsuits, so I'll take and go through them quickly. But the federal government one, I think, is in lots of ways the most important because back in the end of 2021, a Medicare issued a, a set of rules. They do that every year mm -hmm. where they have something called the Quality Improvement Program that, that primary care physicians use um, when they're billing Medicare for the care of Medicare patients. And if they do certain activities, they can get bonuses. And the activity that they uh, decided would be useful would be to create anti-racism protocols in primary care practices. And, you know, anti-racism, it's a, it's a nice word and, and people have created lots of words that sound wonderful, but in fact, anti-racism speaks specifically to discriminatory practices. It says, okay, you know, 150, 200 years ago, blacks were treated terribly in the United States. True. 
And therefore, we need to discriminate today about what happened at that time. Right. And we need to discriminate in the future to remedy any discriminations we have today. That's the mantra of Ibram Kennedy, one of the, right. uh, oh. Ibram Kendi, one of the, you know, gurus of, of, um, um, yes. So-called the anti -racial. He's got a very he's got a very profitable industry going right now. Yeah, and that's a that's a an important point that I think comes up again and again is who's getting you know rich off the fat of the land here with these activities. That's it. That's so it. Yeah. Um, so we we initiated a lawsuit that um, about this saying that um, because we had two practitioners, one in Kentucky and one in Mississippi, who said you know I don't want to discriminate against my patients. Now it's one, th and and that's what's really being called for here. You've yes. got to come up with a plan where blacks yes. are going to be treated differently than whites, and we want these people, as as you and I, as physicians, want to treat everybody the same, and and not and be colorblind. In medicine, yes. it's really important. There may be parts of life where it it might be different, but in medicine, it can't be different. It's right. got to be everybody's treated the same. Exactly. And so that's these the two. Way, that's the way you and I were trained. Absolutely. We, and, and we, were trained, we were also trained not to see people as parts of a group. We were trained no. to see them as individuals. And this Correct. and this speaks to every person who walks in whose skin is a little darker than mine. I have to treat because they're part of some group of dark skinned people, which I find incredibly insulting. And, 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 and treat absurd. white people differently because they're white. Yes, exactly. So um, so we sued the federal government. And it's interesting that um uh, Secretary Becerra, who is the Secretary of Health mm -hmm. and Human Services, was testifying in front of Congress, and Congressman Palmer from Alabama said to him, um, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, we don't do that. And then he had to show him the rule. He had to hold it up because he didn't even know what rule they had published. So clearly the bu bureaucracy is pushing through these of sorts of, of things under the the approval of the administration. It's ubiquitous. So we sued them, and now we have eight states. Attorney generals have joined in the lawsuit, and we're not the parties to it. We're not. Do no harm is not harm, but its members are, yes. and its members have standing yes. to make this case. So this is working its way through the court. So this will be an important lawsuit. But you know, the courts, the grinds of just uh, the wheels of justice mm -hmm. grind slowly. So yes. it will probably take a while for it, this to be manifest. Wow. We have two other lawsuits going. Just to mention it. And the reason I focus on this is because, again, do no harm's goal is to do things, not just to uh, advocate and not just to um, make the public aware of something, but actually to accomplish change. So the other lawsuit is against an interesting organization is Health Affairs. Now, Health Affairs is an is a, a interesting story, too, I think. Your listeners might be find this amusing. So Health Affairs is a journal that it's called the, the the Bible of Health Policy. It's a very important right. journal. And um, as Do No Harm was being formed, we became aware of an of a issue that they put out saying that they were going to go full bore on anti-racism. And that meant examining every aspect of their activity as a journal, as a scientific journal, and make sure they had reviewers that represented minority groups and even authors that represented minority groups and we wrote this up as a, a blog post on our website, which is do no harm medicine.org, yes. one, one word. And um, one day, actually, I was on vacation. I was sitting in a pub in Ireland, and I got this email from the editor saying, what evidence do you have that that's what we want to do? And I just wrote back a link. That's all I put in my email, which is a link to his own article, which declared that that was exactly what they were going to do. Well, now we fast forward about, uh, and I didn't hear back from him, we fast forward about uh, three months, and we, as from Do No Harm, tried to put ads in various medical journals asking, do you have, have you, you physicians reading these medical journals, have you uh, experienced discrimination in healthcare? Because if you have, we'd like to hear about it. Obviously, the discrimination we're talking about is this treating people differently based on race. Yes. Everybody rejected it except Health Affairs. Health Affairs took the um, took the the ad and published it, and then the editor, Dr. Weil, wrote a long editorial on their online edition saying what jerks we were because we were adopting this position and how clever they were because they were taking our money for the ad and they were going to use that money to do whatever they wanted. 
Well, one of the things they wanted to do with that money, and, and this he, it was a very long piece that he wrote telling how terrible we were because we were uh, pushing against discriminatory practices in medicine and, and discriminatory practices in science, which make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Oh, but that's what they're going for. That's no, no. Going for all of it. Going for all of it. You're absolutely right. So then we found that on their website, on Health Affairs website, they have a fellowship that uh, is specifically aimed at people that are not white or Asian. You right. can apply for this fellowship as long as you're not white or Asian. And this fellowship uh, entitles whoever gets it to an experience in, in medical publishing and in medical and article reviewing and all the sorts of things that a young uh, practitioner might be a PhD student or an MD yeah. student would find really attractive. But whites are excluded. Asians are excluded. So um, we sued them over that, and um, they um, they've come back and, and they first they they were interested in settling this thing, but then they decided no they're going to fight us. And the argument that they're using, which is just I just read today that Aaron Sebarium in the Washington Free mm -hmm. Beacon is is writing about this because their argument back to us is they have a First Amendment right to mm -hmm. uh, discriminate. Wow, so mind you, something that in the past liberals and progressives felt was awful that people couldn't say i have a right to, to discriminate i have a right to right. discriminate against blacks against jews against right. catholics against anybody i want because i have the right of free speech they yeah, now are saying that's their right to discriminate because yes. they're they think they're doing something good so well we have a supreme court justice now uh, justice brown jackson who has argued uh, i think it was a couple of weeks ago that the 14th Amendment specifically enshrines uh, racial preference on the part of the federal government. Yeah. She's well, actually you know, making look, that argument. You know, I mean, it's a wonderful country and people have a right to make their arguments. And, and ultimately, she's a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> yeah, and ultimately the Supreme Court will, will weigh in on it and uh, yeah. and we'll see where they come yeah. down. But but anyway, and we'll see how this case works. Is this case may turn out to be a really interesting case where that particular theory will get tested again. Apparently, the Boy Scouts used that theory years ago to say why they excluded gay people from becoming members of the Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. and it was apparently an accepted argument then, back in you know God knows how long ago. Right. But it, well, you know, in the last fifty or sixty years, that was an acceptable argument, and today it's not acceptable. You know, so much of it hinges, I think, on whether or not something's considered a public entity or a private entity if they're entirely privately funded, like a private yes. club. Uh, and I don't know what health affairs uh, yeah. sources of revenues are, but if they're government revenues, and of course, it, you know, it gets to the it gets to the argument. Uh, and the phenomenon that, of course, you talk about so well in your book and other writings, um, what what I taking my cue from uh, President Eisenhower's reference to the military industrial complex, uh, we have uh, in America uh, an education government complex and I would contend also a medicine government complex and do no harm is acting at the intersection of those mm -hmm. two uh, to uh, make everybody aware of what is happening uh, to skew uh, these uh, these institutions, if you will, or these the, these uh, systems, such as they are, these incredibly important aspects of our society, toward a very specific uh, philosophy. And you're right about the march through our institutions. A lot of folks refer to it as the march of Marxism through our institutions. Yes, yes, exactly. Tell me, Dr. Goldfarb, because of course our, our listeners are no doubt uh, involved in healthcare. Uh, some of them probably practice in some way uh, or provide in some way. And of course, we're all patients or you know relatives of patients. What do you fear? Uh, you talk about it in your book uh, and you're so cogent and so spot on. What do you fear the consequences will be of diverting attention from merit and from the science uh, of human biology, which is the specific remit of the physician, and this is certainly the argument that I make and that you make, you know, we have physicians who are extremely uh, expensive 
to to train and to educate. Uh, and they should be working to the top of their qualifications and their certification, which have very specifically, you can you can be as aware of socioeconomic and, and sociological phenomena as you like and of history as you like, but eventually you are going to have to intervene on a patient and yeah. administer them a medication or a therapy or do a procedure on them. What 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 should our listeners be looking out for? Uh, you know, what do you, what do you want to? Yeah. You know, one of our, um, one of our senior fellows is a woman, uh, Benita Orr. And she, she is uh, South African. She's a black woman from South Africa. She emigrated to the United States and she's passionate about this because she lived through real medical apartheid. She lived through this circumstance where white people went to white doctors, black people went to black doctors, black people had much less access to healthcare, so their care was much worse because of that. So that's really an end game here. And mind you, that is the preferred end game. There's a big movement afoot that we should train more black doctors, not because of any reason, except that this is the only way black people are going to get good health care. So, and, and, and mind you, there is absolutely no valid evidence for this. There are hundreds of papers that claim this, but every time we look at them, we've written up some of them that we yeah. have on our website. It, it just yeah. is nonsense. It's just nonsensical. There's no real data to support that. They make up, the, they they find a disparity and they blame it on the fact that, um, you know, that white, that white doctors are discriminating against black patients, having implicit bias, which is yeah. an, another nonsensical notion. Um, so that's the fear. The fear is that we're going to have white people go into the hospital and say, I only want a white doctor. And that happens sometimes. And we tell them, look, find another hospital. That's the way you feel. We're not we're not playing that game, but that game is going to become the rule if these people have their way. So that's the that's the great fear that we're going to just uh, divide society more and more rather than integrate society. And when you really think about it, the whole idea of this business is so crazy. I know one of uh, I think so, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Alito was asking one of the um presenters at the at the court today says, OK, you know, you want to divide people on race. Suppose a student says, I have one grandparent that's black. Does that count? Suppose I have a great grandparent that's black. Does that count? One. You know, wh where does this end? We have a country where there's increasingly um, an intermarriage between people of different of skin colors. Where, where are we going with this? I mean, th this is all really just a, a ridiculous thing. And I think the point you made before, Nan, about the fact that there's money you know, yes. underlying this is a big, big part of it. Exactly. These people are making their University of Michigan has 142 people in its diversity program there. Everybody's getting a, getting a lot of money pushing this stuff. And this is not good for America. And that, that's what bothers me the most. You know, I'm at the end of my career. I'm getting to the end of my life. I don't want to leave my grandkids a life where, you know, this racial crap becomes something that they have to deal with. I had to deal with it when I was a student in 1965, you know, leaving college. And I, it's so wonderful. You don't have to deal with it now. You know, I went to, I went to Princeton. And the reason I say You're this- You're a Princetonian is, as well, Dr. Yeah, so, so am I. Oh, well, terrific. Well, so I went, <laughs> Princeton every year has, a, has something called the P-Raid at the time of I know. <laughs> graduation. And you stand there and you watch class after class march down. So the classes of my era march down. Everybody's white old men. Of course. Then it comes in the 50s and we start to see right. a few, and then all of a sudden women appear, which yes. obviously you, and I think benefited from, because I think it's it's been a wonderful thing. And now, so, and then suddenly the faces start to change. And by the time you get to the current group, there's a tremendous heterogeneity of people. Right. And that's the way it ought to be. And that's the way America is. And you don't look at someone nowadays about their skin. And they're trying to make the claim that this is still going on and this is responsible for any economic yeah. dislocations or anything. Right. And it's all nonsense. It really is absolute nonsense. So anyway. And and, and I, I, I've been so disappointed in, you know, you've described, of course, the approach of the medical establishment overwhelmingly, highly, highly politicized now. Academic medicine is, is gone for the moment, in my humble estimation, until uh, people like you lead it back to a better place. But uh, I don't, I was on the National Annual Giving Committee for Princeton. I don't even give a dime to Princeton anymore. I'm so disgusted by the fact that in the summer of 2020, they assumed uh, that the reason for uh, what happened, the terrible things that happened in Minneapolis 
uh, were prima facie evidence of systemic racism and that now we had to atone for that. There was no sense of inquiry, no sense of uh, open-mindedly looking at uh, phenomena in our society without deliberately blocking off a, a specific set of influences that shall not be discussed. And, and I thought it was uh, antithetical to the purpose of the academy. And no, I, I agree. Like I agree. Clearly. And let me, let me just go back to this business of Princeton, because you could argue, and I, I try to look at both sides of the argument, you could argue, well, look, Goldfarb, you're making the case for affirmative action. And there was a case, there was a time, there was a point. And, you know, yeah. the famous uh, injunction by the Supreme Court uh, was that this was when they did the, the Grutter ruling, which yeah. affirmed affirmative action was right. it, you know, about 25 years. We need this and then things right. will be OK. Well, we're pretty much there and we right. are there and the times have changed. And now there are plenty of brilliant black kids who could get into Princeton, who should get into Princeton on the merits. And you're at, you're absolutely right. You made the point before that, you know, doesn't this undermine the, this, the black kids that um, really deserve to be there and are there because of their academic achievements and their brilliance and their, their hard work. And it, you can turn around and say, yeah, well, yeah, but they were there because, you know, somebody decided they were going to get a leg up compared to a white kid. Um, and, you know, this is this undermines their achievements as well, which is just another incredible downside of it. And I think people like Glenn Lurie and John McWhorter have yes, pointed this yes. out. These brilliant people. Heroes. Don't tell me I got to my position because of my skin color. I got to my position because of my brains. And that's the way it should be. And that's exactly. Be exactly. And don't expect me to behave differently as a scholar or as an intellect because I am of a certain race or a certain gender or whatever my mm -hmm. demographic may be. And it's and the concern that I that I have um, as as someone who, you know, well, obviously, I'm sure Princeton was broadening its horizons when it looked at candidates like me in the 70s, uh, but but merit was still uh, at, at the top of of the criteria. You could not succeed but by merit. Uh, and what concerns me about the House of Medicine is that, as you so cogently describe it in your book, me merit. You know the actual intellectual uh, ability to apprehend and comprehend an enormous amount of very uh, complex and nuanced information, a fund of knowledge that must be mastered, uh, a, a way of reasoning that must be mastered, that is being disregarded in order to accommodate, because as you say, the time is short, you know, four years fly by in medical school to accommodate this enormous uh, body of material that is, uh, as you say, really uh, peripheral to, entirely peripheral to the purpose of training physicians. Yeah. You know, um, my, I remember that the woman that I mentioned that became the, the vice dean at Penn, one day when I was having this, one of my many arguments with her, you know, and I have great respect for her. She's a smart woman and all, but yeah. I had this argument with her and she said, well, you know, whatever they don't know, they can look up. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's, you know, that's really the problem here because they're not going to know what they don't know. You know, it's, <laughs> and they're, and, and I think one of the examples that happened at the time of the, um, at the beginning of the pandemic is all these First year residents yes. were thrown into caring for patients and they were totally overwhelmed. They had no idea because they really weren't had much demanded of them in medical school. Right. Now, I, I believe in residency programs, they start to learn to be doctors, but by the time they finish, they're being trained much more as technicians than as really sort of clinical scientists who are going to approach every patient with kind of insights and awareness and subtlety and nuances, which is really what you have to do. Instead, they're going to think, Okay, you know, in your case it might be here's a vision problem, I do X. In my case, it right. might be here's a kidney number, I'm going to do Y. That's and they they they're they're being deprived of learning really deep understanding of the mechanisms underlying the clinical problems that apply across fields. Whether you're an orthopedic surgeon or neurosurgeon, a, a, even a psychiatrist, you need to understand Absolutely. these basic mechanisms so you can deal with new developments, new diseases, and new medications and. And I don't think it's just, you know, sort of goofy for me to make these arguments, which Twitter has claimed. They they had this famous thing called the Goldfarb Challenge. 
I don't, you know, it was infamous, I guess. I didn't in, see that. My article because it was things like, um, my patient can't pay for their, my med their medication, but I understand how the loop of Henley works. Are you kidding? That, that, oh, no, yeah. that, and that went on. They had multiple examples like this. And I said, okay, fine. I understand. It's more, it's important that the patient can, what are you going to do about the fact that the patient can, what, what's, right. what are you going to bring to right. the table? Right. And what it always is, is I'm going to refer them to the social worker. And that's the correct <laughs> answer. And that's yeah. the end of it. I mean, I mean yes. I give you two lectures about why poverty is terrible. And every right. time you have a patient that can't afford their medicine, ask them about their medicine, ask them if they can get to the, the doctor's office. And that's really what you can contribute to their right. care and then send them to the social worker, which I did all the time. And sure. I didn't need, you know, six to eight months yeah. of solid teaching and social work in order to accomplish that. No, yeah. you have to you have to be able to do that triage. And indeed, you do need to be able to view your patient not merely as a series of, of uh, chemical reactions or anatomical systems, but as a whole person. Every great doctor does that, but they that does not mean that it's not at least as important to understand exactly how that body works and what makes it work and what you know what happens when you do what you do. You know, if you don't understand biochemistry, uh, <laughs> you're 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 really at a loss as to uh, how you're going to predict uh, and interpret what happens to a patient when you make an intervention. And yeah. it just, to me, it's insanity on stilts as so many of these things are. But Dr. Goldfarb, eventually, and this is, you know, I've, I've said this and yes, it's apocalyptic, but you know, when do we see the American public really awakening broadly. I think we're starting to see it with mm -hmm. K through 12 education, which is heartening. But you know, when we see bridges collapsing, when we see airplanes falling out of the sky because the pilots haven't been properly trained and vetted, uh, when we see patients dying because they were not given the proper care, where do you think the American public, uh, you know, how far do you think this will go before people actually start to take notice, uh, notwithstanding your Herculean efforts, of course. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's a good question. You know, I was on a, I gave a lecture to a, a group that was meeting up in Canada this weekend at, in Nova Scotia called Free Speech in Medicine. Mm -hmm. And they were terrific. And they asked some of the, the very good questions you're, you're asking. That was one of the questions they asked. And, you know, it's, it's a tough one because the, the progressive uh, language and thought processes have so, uh, have so captured uh, medical education. And, and yeah. medicine is one field, as you know, where the academic world has tremendous power because it, 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 yes. academic medical centers it contain both medical schools and also the leading healthcare delivery institutions in the same place. Right. And they're very much under the thrall of what really is a progressive ideology here. Now, why they have it, we can talk about, but what when's it gonna change? You know, I think it's going to it's going to fall on of its own weight. And, and I, you know, I think this idea that there's there are tremendous Marxist uh, characteristics to this whole thing where there's a, sort of an authoritarian way. This is the way you need to think. And to me, one of the encouraging things is that those systems always fall of their own weight. You know, they, they just people hate the authoritarian part. People are going to be more and more angry when they have to tell the uh, promotion committee in a medical school why they have encouraged yeah. diversity when in their hearts they know I want to hire the best postdocs. I don't want to hire someone just because of their skin color, even though they may be perfectly fine. There's someone better who's coming from Nova Scotia or is coming right. from Nigeria or wherever the hell they're coming right. from. That I want to hire the best and smartest person I can get my hands on. And that's what I want. And I really don't care about this stuff because I'm trying to do science. I'm not trying to do social work right. here. Right. And so I think I think that's an encouraging long term trend. I think the short term, uh, I think it's going to require, you know, a political dimension to it. And do no harm has a, a, a pretty uh, robust legislative agenda. We're meeting with uh, various state legislature representatives and governors and attorneys general and um, giving them model, model uh, I'm sorry, model legislation, for example, um, we think that the public ought to know exactly what criteria are used to accept people into states funded medical schools. And you made the point before mm -hmm. that a lot of these legal approaches need to be based on uh, them accepting government money. And right. many state medical schools uh, exist in states that have 
for and, and and again we're not partisan here but states that have republican uh governors and legislatures where they have some willingness to listen to these arguments right so we did we've uh, done that I, I, i'll raise another issue here which we started to talk a little bit about but i think another example of how you can make a difference is um in florida the florida board of medicine and osteopathic medicine just met last last uh, friday i guess and they have decided to ban uh, gender affirming care for for children and we played a strong role in this now i i have no expertise in treating um, children that have gender dysphoria. I do as a person, as a father, as a grandfather, find the notion that, you know, a 12 year old or an eight year old is going to be able to make any rational decisions about something as irreversible as taking hormonal therapy, potentially irreversible. I know it's, it's controversial about puberty blockers and certainly irreversible about surgical procedures. And, and so we, we marshaled our, um, our membership, and we turns out we had a lot of members of Do No Harm who were pediatric endocrinologists and endocrinologists, and they wrote in and they wrote the most moving statements. Many of them said, "I cared for these children. I stopped doing it because I think it's crazy that we're, what yes. what we were doing. We don't have any data to support that this is the right thing to do to these kids, right. and all these European countries like Finland and England and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and Sweden." And the Netherlands have decided not to pursue this therapy anymore because it's just so. It ended up the and ended up the Florida board voted that to to prevent uh, children from receiving yes. these medications. And you know, in in Europe, it's only part of a, a clinical study. But it, but here the point was, I mean, it wasn't that we were against any child ever undergoing this, but the idea that as soon as a child makes these claims that you should support them, that's what gender right. care is, right. is, is insane. Well, and, yes. and, and, and because they, what they need at that point is to go into intense psychological yes. treatment and they yes. need to go into psychotherapy. They need right. to, people need to understand why they're making this choice because many of them are just depressed or yes. many of them, many of it is, you know, it's, the question is whether this is some sort of social contagion that's occurring with some of these kids. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. You need to include, it including out. among the parents. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And that's the problem. I mean, some of the parents, they want to do the best for their kids. No doubt about yes. that. They're, they think they're doing the best. But we have all these kids that are detransitioning. And as you know, and in medicine, we always are balancing risks and benefits yes. and we don't know yes. the risks for an individual right. child. And, and how can we go ahead and, and recommend something that we do not know what the long-term outcome is really going to no. be. Now we could, we may be able to tell them you have a 20% chance you're going to change your mind. Do you want to go through with this? You have a 50% chance you're going to change right. your mind. I don't know what the number is, but that's a number you must know before you can go ahead and Absolutely. recommend these treatments to a child. Absolutely. And it may be that 50% will benefit and 50% will be irreversibly harmed. And then, you know, society, the medical world needs to make a judgment about this. But what's happened is they've made a judgment. This is a good thing based on, I think, politics again. Based oh, absolutely. On reality, yes. Not based on, okay. on science. So anyway, so that's, I mean, I've raised that simply because it's an example of how we can change things. We've got to go to the legislatures. We've got to go to the, those folks at the state level because states govern medical care and yeah. tell them that, you know, if, a, if a, for example, does a hospital have any, any time a hospital decides to have a discriminatory policy, they have to publish it. And that, you know, the, the state is going to say that discriminatory practices in medicine where one group is favored over another. Right. Harvard has a, had, advocated for a program, which, which is kind of an interesting story too. So they did a study as an example of, of, of pushing back and what you have to push back against in the legislature. So they, they did a study in uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital where they found that if they looked at patients that came into the emergency room with heart failure, yes. they found that 45% of the black patients that came in got sent to a cardiology ward and 57 patients of 57% of, of white patients with the same diagnosis went to the went to a cardiology ward and they saw that as evidence of bias <laughs> now most doctors i talk to say well what what kind of patients were they right. well so it turns out the white patients had much more of specific valvular heart disease and arrhythmias which would require cardiology procedures 
Right. And many more of the black patients had chronic kidney disease and were on dialysis. So dialysis patients come in all the time. Right. They're volume overloaded, fluid overloaded because they can't right. excrete it. And their treatment is a dialysis treatment, which is often much better organized to be done in the hospital on a general medical floor. Yes. So I looked at the study and I said, well, I don't understand these statistics, which were very complicated, but it seems to me that that's not enough to make the claim of bias. And that, and, but Harvard it didn't bother them. They went ahead and instituted a program where if a heart failure patient comes into the Brigham now, there's a prompt on the computer that says, remember that we've treated black patients differently than white patients in the past. See if that patient wants to go to a cardiology floor. They were going to make that requirement, but then they realized that was probably a bridge too far. Well, and just to point out, they, you know, we wrote to that, the study uh, authors and asked them for the data so that we could look at it more carefully, but they refused to send it to us. They said it's confidential, even though in their article, they really? say they'll make it, yeah, they'll make it available yeah. to anyone who wants the data. Dr. Goldfarb, that's, that, that actually brings up what I wanted to talk with you about, which is, uh, especially when you mentioned Florida, I think Florida has an amazingly talented surgeon general. Note well that he is a black American, Dr. Yes. Joseph Ladapo, right. uh, probably the best state surgeon general in the country. And yet he has been condemned roundly uh, by, by po political figures, by the regime media, as I call it, uh, because he has been uh, pragmatic and straightforward about using data to guide decisions, including decisions about mandatory COVID vaccination in young people. Uh, my, my question being this, um, what do we do about the culture of suppression and silence, of condemnation, of cancellation uh, that has become so pervasive? I view it as part and parcel of the march toward uh, what they hope will be the victory of, of Marxism. I think intersectionality is crucial to that. Everyone gets co-opted. Everyone becomes vulnerable. You know, everyone could be in the star chamber. But what do we do about that culture of suppression? Yeah. Well, I just got suppressed. So <laughs> I, can, I can tell you, I was an editor in chief of uh, Up to Date, which is a widely yes. used... Uh, yeah, Huge. they just fired me. They just fired me for my my views. Um, somebody wrote an article in Stat News, which just attacked me of being a racist. Stat News said, is Stat News is, I think, very left leaning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, whatever. I mean, this is uh, this young man's opinion, and they acted upon it and and called me and said, you know, we it's hurting our brand, quote unquote, and um, you know, and we have no guts at all. And I said, oh, yeah, you're right. I should resign. I don't want you've been good to me. And then I said, no, that's ridiculous. I didn't do anything wrong. So yeah. I just said, you fire me if you have to fire me. And they fired me. Yeah. So, um, sorry. yeah. So uh, I'm sorry. I kind of went off on one. So the, no, not at all. No, because you're right. It's a perfect example. There was zero merit mm -hmm. in your being fired by up to date. It was not about your clinical work the clinical standards, the inherent merit, according to the standards of a profession, and yet you were fired because your politics didn't uh, please someone. This is, yeah. this is disgusting. And of course, we see it all the time. Independent Women's Forum has very vigorous efforts. Uh, I'm proud to say, uh, you know, we have our entire legal division uh, devoted to challenging uh, these sorts of injustices, uh, calling them out and challenging them. But for our listeners, uh, you know, I personally think one of the most important things we can do is even if we feel as though we're a tiny drop in an ocean, get involved, speak, speak as freely as you can, speak for your friends and colleagues who cannot speak. And I wondered what you think about that kind of, you know, yeah, what, yeah, what no, you do. absolutely. I think, and that's why, you know, our organization is a membership organization, which allows us when people are actually dealt with unfairly and the legal system comes down on them to, to consider, I mean, we can't sue everybody in, in, under every instance here, but, you know, we get a lot of tips in and we've tried to help individuals, yeah. but the legal system is uh, part of the way we need to approach this. We ju It's just not enough to be advocates. We need to see laws passed that say this kind of activity is terrible. For example, there are a bunch of, of, uh, schools now uh, 
uh, that require these DEI statements, diversity, equity, and inclusion statements for people to be promoted. It, so it's a, it, that is a freedom of speech question. If they don't believe that that what they should be doing in their physics lab is to promoting diversity, but that they believe they should be promoting promoting the best kind of experiments in physics, they may feel I'm being coerced into saying something that I really don't believe, and that's un-American. It just Absolutely. is. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's that's an important part. But, you know, one of the things that happened in, in that meeting up in Canada that I mentioned was a young woman came up. Remember her name, but I won't repeat it here. I don't want to get her in trouble. But she said she's a psychiatry resident. And um, what can she do to speak out? And I said to her, you're not going to like what I say, but I don't want you to speak out because I'm worried about you. You're going to get ground down by this. And I think it's more people like me who sort of towards the end of their careers that don't yeah. have much, don't have much to lose. I mean, I still have stuff to lose. I guess I have friends and I have sure. <laughs> kinds right. of professional associations and all. They, they, for example, they took my name out of the history of the renal division at Penn. I was a co-director of the technology division. They took my name out of the history, which I thought was amusing. That is, it, that's, that's straight up Maoist. Yeah, I know. It's just ridiculous. But that's, I think it speaks incredible. more to, to how petty they are rather well, of than Of course it does. You're right, else. Dr. Goldfarb. But it's, I mean, that's the kind of, it's a, ooh, you know, it just makes them look foolish. Well, we'll get back. We'll 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 have yeah. our day. <laughs> but yeah. but um, it's so but, yeah. leftist, though. That's what they do. That's why yeah. they tear down statues and rename and negate and threaten and yeah. threaten. And they use the lethal force of government, which uh, I always remind my, my friends, <laughs> and it sounds apocalyptic, but it's true. The defining property of government versus enterprise versus yeah. private citizenry is that government has lethal force. Mm -hmm. Government can kill us. Uh, yeah, we, we have so. lethal policing power. So everything that resides in government ultimately has that, uh, that force behind it. And I think one of the biggest problems that we have, probably the, you know, the, the, the foundational problem is that ever since the 1930s, we've put more and more and more, including virtually the entirety of medicine, when it comes right down to it, most of it, you know, 90 percent, whatever it might be, uh, and of education in the hands of the government. Yeah. And no, so, you know, they wield extraordinary power and that makes it very difficult for those of us who want to. Uh, challenge, but I am heartened by uh, what you're doing. You are you are definitely uh, making uh, a real uh, impact on the public discourse, uh, and it's gratifying to see you on all these different outlets. We have just a couple of minutes left, Dr. Goldfarb, and I thank you so much for your for everything you're doing and for your time with us today. What can we do? What can we, uh, independent women, do? Uh, most directly to help further the mission of do no harm. Yeah, well, I would say two things. One is, uh, but thank you for your kind words. I, I don't feel, I, I sort of feel like, you know, I'm just sort of getting it off my chest more than anything else. So it's very well, we're, 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 we're grateful that you are. <laughs> but I think one I think I think joining us or other, there are other membership organizations, we're one, you're another one, yes. that if people join us, that gives us, more power because, and we're looking for a national presence here that, for example, so we can do what we did in Florida, call on physicians to write in when, and give testimony for supporting, uh, you know, positions that the legislators need doctors to come and tell them, yes, it's okay. You can get rid of something that's really a terrible view. And the other thing is I think organizations like ours need to think about getting together. I think we need, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of doing things through alliances because you need to have your own people mm -hmm. and your own approaches but but occasionally there's there's a role for the UN you know it, it's right. it happens once a decade or once every hundred years or so but uh, there are times when everybody getting together mm -hmm. and condemning activities uh, mm -hmm. and having multiple organizations do it from all yes. across the political spectrum can be very very useful but I, I think I think people need to there are organizations out there like ours like yours that are that have the the wherewithal to to have make a difference. We have legal representation. You have legal. We have public relations firms. We have real capacity to to sort of get our our ideas out there. And they yeah. and they need to join us. We're not looking for their contributions. We're looking. I mean, that's fine. I, I think it's a wonderful thing when they do. But what we're really looking for is their support and their um, 
their emotional support and political support and willing to commit themselves and stand up. It, it, for this Florida uh, effort that we had, we had doctors said I was afraid to speak out, but I realized I had to speak out. Yes. And, and I think other people start to feel like that will have power. And then this is the way movements start. Yes. And I'll, I'll say one other thing that we're doing that I hope people will look at our website is that we're trying to attack the, the evidence. They, they talk about the evidence shows, but when you examine the evidence that right. the left puts forth to argue for some of these uh, things like concordance between doctors, uh, race and patients race, we find that the evidence is awful. And it, in fact, doesn't support the contentions mm -hmm. at all. So we're trying to go through important papers and we've done this a little bit on our website yes. to argue yes. against these kinds of ideas as well. So I think the public can do a lot. And I think I think joining in organizations that are starting to step up is really probably the best place to start. Absolutely. Well, and and our our listeners and viewers can find you at do no harm medicine.org, Dr. Goldfarb. Run one word, do no harm medicine.org. Two met two M's in a row there. <laughs> do no harm <laughs> in medicine. True. Yeah, <laughs> but it's good. It's good. Okay, uh, you know, I I am proud to be. I as soon as I discovered you, I I signed on and I did. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. We appreciate that very much. Yes, yeah, it's it. it the, the thanks go to you. I mean, it's it's very easy to sign up, but um, it it, it really your your work exemplifies what we do, and I agree with you. You know, we talk about intersectionality in a condemnatory way in terms of the march of Marxism, but it is true that we all do synergize with each other, uh, and when we can convene in uh, places like this and others, uh, our voices uh, definitely uh, are, are magnified. Uh, we punch way above our weight. So, Dr. Goldfarb, I want to thank you for everything you've done. Um, and urge all our viewers to go to do no harm and uh, uh, be aware of, uh, of the, the uh, work of this uh, incredible organization and uh, continue to support it. So thank you, Dr. Goldfarb. Thank you so much. It was great talking with you. And with you.